The ministry of Prism Restorative Justice offers spiritual care and companionship with some of the most marginalized in our society, those living in exile in our jails and prisons. The ministry is led by the monks of the Community of Divine Love and includes roughly 30 volunteers that assist our efforts, which are concentrated in three facilities of the Los Angeles County Jail System. Join us for PRISM's annual fundraiser, Saturday, October 28th, Stories from the Heart, an evening of creative storytelling from Voices on the Edge. Learn more and get your tickets at www.prismjustice.org. God made them in his icon. In his own icon did God make them. In the name of God, in whose image we are born. Amen. Every other year of Peg Bradley's childhood, her father, a devout Quaker, took his family across the United States from Phoenix to Canandaigua, New York, near Rochester. Peg is the oldest child and has six siblings, so every other year there was a new passenger until the station wagon carrying nine Arizonans to Lake Canandaigua was full, a journey of 2,300 miles with nine people in the wagon. <laughs> Peg's memories of those trips, especially in a full car year, are somewhat harrowing on the travel side and quite delightful on the visit side. The delight was in the fact that the Quaker family lived on a farm, and Peg recalls with special fondness her connecting with the animals. Her most, most poignant memory was waking quite early, not her favorite thing to this day, but waking early and drinking warm milk squirted directly from the cow's udder. For that reason, as part of our hybrid sabbatical this summer, which was primarily a study in memory care, we flew to upstate New York to reconnect with the family, which on her father's side are still devout Quakers. Peg very much wanted to visit the Quaker meeting house where the family still attends church. There is a depth of faith in the Quaker tradition that I have always admired, especially regarding its teaching about centering, centering oneself on the holy within. There was a tract in that Quaker meeting house written by Elder Thomas R. Kelly who says, we are trying to be several selves at once without all ourselves being organized by a single mastering life within us. Each of us tends to be not a single self, but a whole committee of selves. We feel honestly the pull of many obligations and try to fulfill them all. But life is meant to be lived from a center, a divine center. Most of us, I fear, have not surrendered all else in order to attend to the holy within. Today's gospel is clearly about attending to the holy within. The story of the trick question presented by those strange bedfellows the Pharisees and the Herodians, leads to one of the best examples of Jesus' Jewishness, particularly in the way he answers a question with a question. Whose head is this? The Greek word translated as head is ikon, icon, a Greek word more often translated as image. Whose image is this on the coin? It is the word used in the Greek Septuagint translation of Genesis, thou shalt not make any graven image. 
icon. When they answered Jesus' question, the Pharisees, therefore, are not just saying the head of Caesar is on the coin. They are saying that the graven image is, on, is Caesar's on the coin that they are holding. The question, of course, was a clever trick. The Pharisees and Herodians are, for the moment, friends, since the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and Jesus was the enemy of both, for different reasons, opposite reasons even. They thought themselves quite clever to have come together to, and crafted this trick question, saying that if Jesus says, pay the tax, he is a traitor to the Jewish people, and the Pharisees have him. And if he says, don't pay the tax, he is a traitor to the occupying Romans, and the Herodians have him. And even if he says, I don't know, then he is a traitor to his role as prophet and loses his position to preach at all. We've got him this time, no matter what he says, they think. But Jesus' famous answer to the trap is so very simple, made all the more simple when the Pharisees themselves acknowledge that the coin they show him, that they have in their hand, has a graven image upon it, and they should not even be touching it. Jesus says, hey, if it's Caesar's coin anyway, seeing it has how his graven image is upon it, then who cares if you give Caesar back his coin? Jesus moved the very ground of the question from the politics of the Roman occupation to the ground of the faith in the Torah. Brilliant. Uh, but Jesus then gives the best line of the short encounter when he continues by speaking not just to the Pharisees and the Herodians, but to you and to me. Jesus says we are to give back to God the things that are God's. And it leaves everyone calculating what exactly is God's that we're supposed to give back. And in case you were wondering, the clue was in the word, icon, image. Jesus' answer came from Genesis. God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. This is the first story of creation, and it gives us man and woman at the same moment. It's the same time of creation. The second story in chapter 2 has the Adam and Eve rendition, but the first story has the two being made together in the image of God, and the image is split, divided between male and female, so that the image may be returned to completeness, the point of Jesus' later teaching on marriage. The principle is this, just as the coin has Caesar's icon on it, so it's Caesar's. And we are made in the image and likeness of God, so we are God's. This text is often used to talk about stewardship in terms of what you give to the church, but this is no teaching on the tithe. For if giving 10% of our income is all we do, we would fall well short of the 90% mark, the rest of the, 90 the rest of the 100%. Jesus says that everything you have and everything you are is God's already. While this would certainly apply to the money you make, the formula is not that you give 100% of your income to God. That was early Christianity's mark, however. For God knows you need the money for necessities of life. The teaching is that you give 100% of yourself to God. And once you have given God some of the money you earn, don't feel that you have bought off an obligation and no longer need to give back more of yourself to God. The 100% formula relates to your calendar as well as your wallet. What God wants is nothing less than to abide, to abide in your heart. You have been made in the imago Dei, the image of God, the icon of the Lord. God keeps your picture 
in the divine wallet on God's desk at the office up there and has it taped onto the heavenly refrigerator. It's your picture. Jesus did not care about the tax, for his real concern was that you live into the image of the God who lovingly created you. Giving back to God through the church does, of course, matter, but giving merely money to the government or to the church or anywhere else is only part of the picture. Give back your heart to God, for it is God's anyway. For in response to the question, what are the things that are God's which we are to give back to God? The answer is you. Elder Kelly's words reflect the Quaker vision of Jesus' teaching on Caesar's coin. Life is meant to be lived from a center, a divine center. Most of us have not surrendered all else in order to attend to the holy within. God made them in his icon. In his own icon did God create them. In the name of God, in whose image we are born. Amen.